it will be afternoon very soon, I think, uh, in a couple of minutes. But greetings to everyone. The reason why we always have these student conversations in this space and why we are looking at it now from the lens of Ukraine and Russia as well is very important. And one of my thinking and philosophies around children's conversations is that everyone needs to be concerned when it comes to a child. And there's just simple one reason about that. Everyone has an experience of childhood. There is no one who became an adult without being a child. So for that reason, we have different, different platforms, different environments, and how we, we experience childhood in our different places. But this is completely different for a certain group of children from Ukraine. In the space that while you and I spend time having porridge, you and I spend time having good things, during our childhood, we went to the park to play. We, some of us played soccer. Some of us did all sort of things. Since 2022, a good number of children in Ukraine have been deprived of this. They've been deprived of, one, their right to play. They've been deprived of, two, their right to, to freedom. They've been deprived of, three, their right of just being a child. The right just to be a child, and this is what is happening. When all these nuclear systems and all these security measures that adults design and agree on, when these things fail, those who have no powers or even how to even shift the bar or regulate the system, you find them in that situation. The good news is, when it comes to law, almost all United Nations countries, member states, that is, have ratified the United Nations Convention on Rights of the Child, except the United States that has not ratified any of those children's rights related instruments. And one of their reasons is because they have a good children's rights mechanism at home in the United States. So no need to duplicate it by ratifying the international conventions. And this is almost the same reason why South Africa uh, also took a long time to ratify the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Because the country felt that we have a good provision in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, that provides economic rights to its citizens. And a good case, you know, uh, 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 a trajectory that we do not need to ratify these international instruments. But the argument then, in 2015, mm -hmm, yes, before 2015 and 2015, when South Africa then ratified, was that there is need for you to provide a different platform of redress in case people fail to access their economic rights. And then South Africa went on to ratify. But we sit in a world in a crisis where Ukraine and Russia have both ratified these two instruments, or this instrument, but there is no accounting mechanism that really looks at holding, for example, Russia who is in this case guilty of you know, stealing, for lack of a better word, or abducting, as we say it in the right legal term, children, a good number of them from Ukraine, taking them into, into Russia, and then reconfiguring their mindset to not become Russians, and to hate Ukraine. In other words, building a certain group of human beings that when they transcend childhood to adulthood, then they have this resentment in them that will continue this war, you know, in the next uh, set of war that will come, we'll find these children fighting against their parent country. But if we shift a bit from there, do we have a history in this continent about children who have been abducted? We do. We do have a history of children who have been trafficked. We have a history of children who have been stolen. We have a history of children who have been removed or adopted from the original place. And one of them, and a very quick one, is what happened in Nigeria, with the Boko Haram situation, where young girls were removed from schools and from their community, you know, and taken to a different space. And the African Union has been very, um, in my own thinking, and what I know happens is that they've been reactionary on this. There's no proactive step that has been taken. And I'll tell us why we don't have that proactive step even within the international community. Is that when you look at the African Union, they want to see 
access and evaluate and ascertain the fact that this number of kids were removed from this place and taken to this place and then send an email or a statement that we want these kids to be brought back. When that happened, and in Nigeria, as of Sunday, the African Union issued a statement asking for the children, 280 children, to be sent back to the Kaduna, Kaduna region in Nigeria because they were adopted you know, from schools and, and all whatnot, which is supposed to be a safe space. Within the international framework, the UN, uh, UN Committee on the Rights of the Child as well has also issued a statement calling on Russia to at least, you know, behave when it comes to all these crises, or at least protect children in these spaces. But that deafness, that deafness of listening to international statements, or that deafness of respecting international uh, 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 um, provisions or international you know, order, it's very common within adults. It is extremely common, and one of the major reasons is because most of the existing mechanisms that deal with children's rights issues do only pass recommendations, and they don't make binding decisions like the IC, like the, the ICC will do, the International Criminal Court. And in my argument on this journey that we've been is that if you ask me if we can configure the ICC or look at the, the, the juvenile justice system within the ICC, can we reconfigure it for it to protect children more? And I'll tell you, we don't need to bother about that. The reason is because for us to reconfigure the ICC would take a lot of time than just creating a different mechanism that will actually target children's rights issues. And will also give these children at least some space to enjoy their, tri their childhood. We don't have that within the international mechanisms. We have the IHSJ, it's an adult-centric institution. We have the ICC, it's an adult-centric institution. The only two major uh, international uh, uh, child-centric institutions that we have is the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child and the African Children's Committee on the Rights of the Child. These two institutions only make recommendations. Some scholars, and us included, we've referred to it as a quasi or quasi quasi judicial institutions. So they, are, they make just recommendations. And states then have the option to follow those recommendations or not to follow those recommendations. If we do not take a stand now, to ensure that the international community also resonates with the number of children who have been removed from many countries, and Russia is what we are discussing now, is that we will have a lot of children across this globe, and one could be yours, that will be deprived from their childhood. So this really pains me a lot, and I think all of us need to take that same pain or feel the same pinch, because we know someone who is a child and we've all been children before. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And there's just a